Welcome everyone. My name is Haley Buckner and I'm the Professional Relations Manager for Elevate Oral Care. Thank you for joining us this evening. Before we start, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. For those of you who remain online past 50 minutes, your CE certificate will be emailed within a few hours of the completion of this talk, so be sure to check your spam folder. You are all muted, so there's no need to worry about background noise. We will have time at the end for questions, and you can submit questions on your webinar dashboard as they will be tracked throughout the talk. We have hosted an extensive series of free live CE webinars on many prevention-related topics. Each of these webinars were recorded and are available with free self-instruction CE at elevateoralcare.com slash elevatingcare. Bookmark this page and return often to see what's new in free CE. If you have a topic you would like to see covered, please feel free to suggest it by sending an email to info at elevateoralcare.com or by completing the webinar survey that will be sent after the completion of the talk this evening. We enjoy looking through your suggestions and creating webinars based on your requests, which is exactly how we came to this evening's topic of infection control. We have seen some requests come in, and so we are excited to bring that content to you this evening. Tonight, we are honored to be joined by Michelle Strange. Michelle brings over 20 years of experience in the dental field, beginning as a dental assistant and earning a bachelor's degree in health science from the Medical University of South Carolina, followed by a master's in dental hygiene education from the University of Bridgeport. Her commitment to ongoing education is evident through her pursuit of various certifications, including the Certificate in Dental Infection Prevention and Control. Michelle's passion for dentistry extends beyond her practice as demonstrated by her community and global endeavors, which include volunteer work and worldwide missions. As the owner of Level Up Infection Prevention, she continues to practice dental hygiene while sharing her expertise through various platforms. Michelle is a co-founder of A Tale of Two Hygienist podcast, further demonstrating her commitment to advancing the dental profession through education and collaboration. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this course. I'm really excited to be invited by Elevate to go over this infection control common mistakes from missteps to mastery. Um, and I am Michelle Strange. I wanted to make this slide deck uh, really calm and <laughs> like lots of clouds and flowers and things like that because I know that this topic is not super fun for everyone. It is a part of our licensing requirements for con continuing education. And so sometimes it's seen as either um, let's just get it done. I need it for my seat and for my license. Um, it's not fun. It's not sexy. It is a means to an end versus being seen as the foundation of patient care. Or I talk about five common mistakes that we'll be talking about tonight and people get anxious because, um, oh my gosh, I didn't know about these things. I haven't been doing those things. I don't think I, our office is doing those things. And so I just, I wanted to try to make this as calm and like as kind as possible in case you're feeling any of that today. <laughs> um, again, uh, my name is Michelle Strange and I just wanna say thank you to Elevate for the opportunity to discuss infection control protocol Calls so we can all create safe dental visits for our patients, um, but also our patients and ourselves, right? Um, so I also am still a practicing dental hygienist. I not only educate on infection control and help offices create their written infection control programs, um, but I'm also in the day-to-day -day clinic life. And I know it sometimes is not always easy to balance the foundations of patient safety with today's dentistry. Um, I started out as an on-the-job trained dental assistant. Actually, I started out as an assistant's assistant. I started in dentistry at 17. Um, and then I progressed into uh, dental hygiene school. And when I graduated, I ended up doing dental surgical assisting and dental hygiene. 
Um, I do love infection control, but I will be the first uh, person to call myself out on some of the very bad, <laughs> very learned behaviors I have had in my 23 years in dentistry. Um, it took me some time to get to mastery in my infection prevention practices. And because of that, I want people to learn my mistakes, learn from my mistakes, I should say. And also I want to make it easier for people to apply the recommendations from OSHA and from the CDC. So in tonight's course, we're gonna tackle these five common mistakes that we make. Um, I know a lot of people need one hour of continuing education um, for their licenses, but if I tried to cover all infection control nuances um, within an hour, um, I you would have to like slow this down. I would be speaking at 2X because <laughs> trying to get through it all. Um, so I wanted to try these five common mistakes that I often have done and I often see as I temp and go into offices and help them create their written infection control protocols. Um, the first of them will be dental unit water line and maintenance, uh, suction line maintenance, our chemical indicators for our sterilization packagings or our instruments for the sterilization, sterilization processes, um, our spore testing, and also our standard operating procedures. Um, but one quick stop. Uh, before we um, dive into these five points is that I wanted to talk about the topic of the ICC. Um, this is super important. Um, it's the infection control coordinator role. Um, it is an important um, vital role in any dental office, but is almost non-existent in dentistry. It's astonishing to realize that it has been two decades since the CDC recommended the establishment of this critical role. However, it's disheartening uh, to witness the slow adoption of this role within the dental community. Now, in the realm of dentistry, we often witness the presence of insurance coordinators, patient care coordinators, even implant coordinators. I've actually played that role in a few practices. And while these other roles are undoubtedly significant, it's equally important, if not more so, to designate a team member to fulfill the responsibilities of the infection control coordinator. So the role of the infection control coordinator is one of the most critical positions within the dental office because this individual is responsible for implementing and overseeing infection control protocols, ensuring compliance with regulations, and safeguarding the health and safety of both patients and team members. And so it's essential for the dental practices to recognize the gravity of infection control and try to prioritize the well-being of all individuals who enter their doors. And by designating an infection control coordinator, dental offices can establish a dedicated individual who will ensure that all necessary measures are in place to prevent the spread of infections and maintain a safe environment. And I would even add, maintain your dental equipment that is so expensive, right? Um, we're gonna talk about a few of those things too, or some of those equipment, pieces of equipment that are so expensive um, and how infection control practices go hand in hand with equipment, equipment maintenance. Um, so just remember that the role of the infection control coordinator is not merely a recommendation, but it is an essential component of providing quality care. And having an ICC in your practice could help make sure that all five topics that I'm talking about today are covered in your practice, that you are doing the right thing and that they have all the logs and records and things in place so that if you were ever to be audited, you would pass with flying colors. Um, one last digression I would like to make from my five points um, is about legacy errors. I almost made this a point in this presentation, but when I like started thinking about it, legacy errors can be seen in each one of these topics I'm discussing tonight. And I can tell you firsthand that I am very guilty and often have to check myself to ensure I'm still not 
swimming in legacy errors. They are a natural part of human behavior and they can creep their little way into our everyday behaviors just oh so easily. So what are legacy errors? Well, in dentistry, a legacy error refers to a mistake or like an incorrect practice that has been perpetuated over time, often passed down from like one generation of dental professionals to the next. And these errors become ingrained in the field and they may even persist despite advancements in knowledge and even technology. So legacy errors can arise due to various factors. Um, let's say like outdated practices, just lack of awareness about the new research and guidelines and technology, resistance to change. That's a hard one and very common one I have witnessed and even struggle with sometimes. Um, or just simply a reliance on tradition without any critical evaluation or auditing of your practices. Um, these errors may relate to treatment techniques, infection control protocols, the materials that you use, or even the way the dental offices are managed. So identifying and addressing legacy errors is essential for the progress and improvement of your dental practices. And by recognizing and rectifying these mistakes, dental professionals can enhance patient care, we can optimize outcomes, and we can align with current evidence-based practices that we should all be following. So uh, one thing I'd love for you to do is I'd like these things to be interactive. Um, feel free to type in the chat like a smiley face if uh, you've been guilty of a, a legacy error. Uh, and I do hope everyone in this on this webinar is typing because we are all guilty of it especially if we don't have systems in place and standard operating procedures or an ICC to help guide us away from these normalized behaviors. Now, before we dive into our water lines, which is our first uh, topic, um, our second topic is gonna be our suction lines. And so I put them both on the screen side by side because I wanna make sure that in our first point, we are only talking about water lines. Our air water syringe and our suction lines, they are apples and oranges. They are different beasts and what we do for our water lines cannot, always, cannot be done to our suction lines. And if you've ever confused these, you are not alone. I mentioned last month um, in a course um, that I had gotten text messages from some of the smartest dental clinicians asking me questions because they have confused these two systems. They're next to each other, but they're, they're different. They are different beasts. There are things that I can do to the water lines that I do not want to do to the suction lines because it can be hazardous. And let me give you one example of what not to do and how this is easier to mess up uh, than I would have thought. So for with our water lines, in some cases, not all cases, um, we can use bleach as a way to shock the lines and kill all the bio burden that can be present. Um, I say not all cases because some of your manufacturer's instructions for use might not support that, but I have used something like this um, in a pinch because it only takes about 10 minutes to shock your lines. So, but when I'm doing it, I would um, empty out the bleach and run water through those lines. The thing is, is that we do not want to use bleach in our suction lines. But I have had many units that were not close to the sink. So I would always just like open up the valve on my suction and run the water into that suction line. And this is a problem when I shock those lines with bleach water solution because we don't want bleach going into the suctions. Or I've even heard of people using like bleach water to, because their lines and their suctions got a little smelly, a little stinky, and we'll talk about that. But because of that, they um, put bleach water solution down in there. But now we have amalgam separators and that would cause quite an issue. Um, so we wanna make sure that the entire team understands that these are two different beasts. We don't use our suction line cleaners in our water lines. We don't use our water line things for our suction lines. They, one is putting water into the mouth, one is taking water out, like two different systems, but they are often confused. So 
let's just jump into our general unit water lines. I have this top of mind because I, it's so common. I am not hearing every office doing all of the things. And I coach um, offices or ask questions when I go into these or I do webinars or I'm doing training sessions. And a lot of people are just very confused by the protocols for our general unit water lines now. Um, the reason that we have these recommendations is because biofilms are not just in the mouth. They're also present in our general unit water lines. And it's related to several factors, um, water stagnation, which um, occurs as a result of inactivity, mostly in the evening, um, throughout the night, or over the weekends or holidays. Um, sometimes uh, not all of our units have anti-retraction valves um, or they have failure on that valve. And so they kind of pull back things into our water lines when we're working on patients. Uh, some offices, uh, I worked in one many, many years ago, but we had water heaters on the, the lines, which was fabulous <laughs> for patient care, uh, but not so great for our water line maintenance. And, you know, we all use a variation of water supply. Maybe it's tap water, maybe it's distilled water, or sterile water. Um, but a lot of these things can factor in to our water line management. And so once the biofilm is formed, it serves as a continuous reservoir of bacteria in our general unit water lines. And yes, on the screen is an actual image of what was in the general unit water lines. It turned it, it looks, that is not Coca-Cola, that is not coffee, that is not soda, that is not any of that. That is the gunk and grossness coming through our water. And we're spraying it in people's mouths, right? We're not always putting it into a cup for it to accumulate, just for us to be like, that's not clear, you know? <laughs> but this happens. And when, like I mentioned, um, our general unit water lines can be this continuous reservoir. And if you think back on, and I, if you don't, haven't taken one of my courses in a while, you might not have heard this in a minute, but we have something called the chain of infection. And when we are looking at the chain of infection, the reservoir where it's all baking and cooking and festering is part of that chain of infection. And so if we can break that chain in multiple places, then we don't have um, cross-contamination. We don't have the spread of infection. And so with our reservoirs, where our dental unit water lines, we have to use very specific protocols to make sure that we are not causing um, or using gross dangerous water on our patients. And there has been multiple cases of infections, mycobacterium abscessus specifically, um, that we are, should be concerned about because our patients have gotten sick from this. I do wanna mention though, it is not the water, it's the water lines. It's bacteria growing in the lines. So if you were going to go put sterile water um, because we're doing a, as an extraction or some kind of surgical practice and you're like, well, I'm using sterile water, but you're sending that through your, your dental unit water lines, it is no longer sterile. It's the water lines, not the water itself. And this is why when you look at this chart, um, so our dental unit water lines are, they're a small diameter. They have a slow drip. Um, the plastic tubing is a lovely little place for bacteria to attach, that biofilm to attach. The tubing is also a source of carbon or food for the bacteria. Um, there's that large surface area to volume ratio. And I mentioned this earlier, we leave it stagnant sometimes. So when you think about how you use your water lines, you spray a little, you dock it. You spray a little, you dock it. You spray a little, you dock it, it sits. Maybe that was your last patient of the day. Where is it sitting? All night, all weekend. What do we do the next day? We come in and, or next time you see patients, you use that water, but all of that in the line has been growing and festering and getting more um, dangerous at, for our patients. So it's the water lines. So here's where we need to talk about how we are going to maintain our dental unit water lines. There is a protocol that has been put out by OSAP, um, which is OSAP.org. That's like my mothership for infection prevention protocols and dentistry. Um, I've also worked with a few um, dental unit water labs and it is testing our water lines 
And this could be if you're doing it for the first time and you fail it, um, there's a protocol for that. I don't have enough time to go into it specifically, but there is great customer service um, protocol or customer service um, people out there that work for these water line companies or water lab companies that can help you. But we want to test. We want to shock. And then we want to use some kind of daily low level chemical that will treat the water so that as it's sitting in the lines, um, it's not growing the bacteria at the same rate. So it's reducing how much biofilm we have in our water lines. So it's testing. We need to know if that actually is working, right? We want to know that our shock is working. We want to know that our low level chemical is working. So we're going to test it. You can do that in office or you can send it into the lab. We're going to shock it and there are multiple products that you can use out there. Um, I always encourage you to check with your manufacturer's instructions for use. And then we're going to use something daily that could be straw or it can be tablets. Um, but just so you know, sterile water, distilled water, all of that, this all needs to be happening with those like sterile water needs to be happening on a whole other separate system but if you're using something like distilled water i often hear people say well i don't do these things because i use distilled water that is not antimicrobial so you still want to use it depending on whatever you know no matter what water that you are using out there and this is um, some do nots for your dental unit water lines. We do not use the dental unit without following the cleaning and disinfection procedures and the manufacturer's reprocessing instructions. I love to say IFUs, IFUs, IFUs. Um, your IFUs are your instructions for use. Always read your IFUs because there's a lot of details about not only your water lines, but how you even sterilize your instruments, right? So we do not want to attach any dental hand pieces or dental instruments to a dental unit water line that has not been cleaned or disinfected as per those IFUs. And do not use cleaning and disinfection agents that are not recommended by the device manufacturer as material incompatibility could result in some damage, some structural damage that may increase the risk of biofilm formation or toxicity to patients. And this information is from the FDA. So not only do we have the FDA telling us to monitor our unit, our dental unit water lines, but we also have um, F, our EPA and then we also have the CDC guidance on that. And I'm actually very curious as to when this will happen, but I think OSHA is going to get involved or it should actually get involved at some point because in those dental unit water lines, when we are aerosolizing air, aerosol, yeah, aerosolizing our um, water for like our cavitrons, our piezo units, our hand pieces, all of that, um, there are certain bacteria that actually we could be breathing in. And if we aren't managing our aerosols very well, that could be a danger to us as employees, which is where OSHA would get involved. So that is what we're gonna be doing for our dental unit water lines. If you are not testing, shocking and treating, um, send me a message. I'd be happy to kind of coach you through that or you can work with me and my company, Level Up Infection Prevention. But I mentioned aerosols and that kind of brings me in to our next point, which is our suction line maintenance. Because if we are aerosolizing um, any of the things in the water lines, we want to manage it with our high volume evacuation. Um, yes, we could be aerosolizing some things uh, from the oral cavity, so we want to manage all things aerosols and our HVE are, um, is a huge engineering control that I think all of us became very aware of <laughs> during uh, the pandemic. I've been uh, talking about this uh, even before the pandemic. I was trying out every HVE on the planet and then the pandemic happened and we got a ton more. And I'm that is like my silver lining from the pandemic is because we were able to get new HVE tubings and types and things. And we learned a lot more about aerosol management uh, because of it. And I bring up HVEs because they attach to our suction lines, right? <laughs> They're attaching to our suctions. And if we are not doing the proper suction line maintenance, then we are not pulling aerosols um, out of the air. We're not catching them before they become a part of our air quality. Um, and it, we have to have proper um, suction lines to do that. And some of these are gunky and gross. And when you're using our, you're doing your suction line maintenance, um, I've heard it 
all over the place. Once a week, once a day, once a month, not at all. Using a bucket, using an aerosol dispenser, using soapy water, using hot water. I've literally heard it all. And there is a right way and a wrong way. There's a lot of right ways and there's quite a few wrong ways, I should say, to do and manage your suction lines. But they are so critical because just as important it is to manage the water going into the patient's mouth, grabbing all of the things out of the air is just as important. Um, and we also can have backflow concerns if we are not managing our suction lines and keeping those clean because that is we need that pressure. We need that pull going through those lines and we can make them sluggish if we're not maintaining them. So you're like, well, how do I maintain my suction lines? Well, there are a few things that we could talk about. Um, one of them is actually our line cleaner. But first off, when we're uh, talking about our chemical that we're gonna be using in it, we need to make sure that the chemical is compatible with your vacuum system. Um, I have heard some manufacturers that said that they will void the warranty if you're using the wrong chemical. The, again, this is where standard operating procedures and the infection control coordinator are just crucial because we are not trying to be out here just like voiding warranties on our very pricey equipment, right? I've been into one office and the doctor's like, do not tell me I need a new, I, I, he was like, I can't. I can't with this world if you tell me I need a new vacuum system. I'm like, I'm not trying to tell you that at all. I'm trying to tell you how not to get to that place. So we wanna make sure that we're using something that is compatible with our vacuum system that is EPA compliant. We want something non-foaming. And I say non-foaming because I was taught way back when uh, to use soapy water and soapy water is very foamy and that foaming can actually um, build up on your vacuum pump and create some problems so we don't want anything foaming uh, we want something non-hazardous obviously because this is now going into our suction which will then go out into the world and so we want to make sure that it is non-hazardous we also and this is super critical now that we have amalgam separators we want something that has a neutral ph because um, it could be mixing with a lot of things in that amalgam separator Obviously we want something cost efficient, right? Like we're not trying to like, you know, spend our budget on suction line maintenance. So we want to find something that's affordable and we want something that's not oxidizing um, or doesn't have an oxidizing agent like chlorine, like a bleach, like the bleach water I was telling you at the top of this, where I used, I sometimes use it as a shock. I do not want that going into my suction lines. Now, I have had a person reach out to me, this was a few years ago, um, where their amalgam separator was full. And that's a whole other topic, but it was full. It was getting stinky, it was getting smelly. And so the office manager, um, instead of calling and asking for that to be picked up and cleaned out um, ahead of time before that year warrant or that year time span, they put bleach water down it, which then became very caustic um, it created a vapor in in the whole building it wasn't just the office they were a part of a whole building so it can be quite an issue please do not do that and then you also want to have a delivery system and i have on here just a few there are quite a few bucket type dispensers out there um, i grew up with using the gallon jug right? <laughs> the gallon, good old gallon jug, um, putting it down in there. But we actually don't want that to happen anymore because our high volume evacuation units are not built really to take a bunch of water coming through them. They were meant to take aerosols, air mixing with that water, right? And so every time you put your um, suction down into a jug of water, what happens? And you can feel it. It goes... <sighs> It like it pulls back and then you pull it out and it releases and it goes through well doing that multiple times can actually wear on your vacuum system um, and think about it like if you were vacuuming anything like if i'm vacuuming along doing the dusting and i grab a curtain and it goes what happens to the vacuum it goes it sucks with me right so that's not good for it long term and it's not really doing everything that you need in your lines in the tubes that we are managing so we want something creating almost like a little funnel, a little tornado twister thing going through it. And our little buckets with the things that hook onto it, that will do that for you. So it's super important that we are not like 
filling our bucket. I saw this in an office on social media the other day where they just didn't even put the lid on it. They were just doing, putting it down in there. It doesn't work like that. So make sure that you're choosing a cleaner that works for your system, that it's pH neutral, it's not hazardous, um, that it is cost effective, but you're using it with the proper dispensing bucket. And I did wanna show you this really fun photo here. <laughs> This is why we have maintenance on our suction. Because think of all the blood, the tissue, the tooth structure, the calculus, the prophy paste, the resin, the composite, the porcelain fragments that are going through these lines. If you never clean them out or do it infrequently, it can get really gross. Um, and like, what do you think's growing in that? Oof. I don't even want to think about it. But we need to kind of think about it because failure to clean our vacuum, our evacuation lines daily leads to this biofilm growth. It leads to a heavy bio burden and a greater risk of cross contamination because it can create a sluggish system, as I talked about, which then can create backflow issues. Um, and then also not move your aerosols like it should. And so if you have a vacuum system and it's not cleaned regularly or daily, these thick deposits will form and it can create a blockage. And think of all the things you do in a day. How many of them with patient care are you not needing a suction? Like <laughs> none of them, right? Like none of them. So we want to make sure that we have... Um, them cleaned out because if it gets clogged like this that is a dental office down day that we are done like there's nothing else that we like it we're closing things and then this isn't like let me just call roto rooter and snake our pipes this is a much bigger issue so just from like i said infection control and an icc can actually help you maintain the equipment in your practice and prevent you from spending more money than you need also, it will help prevent backflow. And this is something that uh, well, I don't think we talk about enough in our practices. And we still have patients closing their mouths around suction. We still say closed around, close the suction. I still have to catch myself every now and again. Um, I do use a backflow preventer. So if I do have somebody that close on, closes their mouth on the suction, I'm not super worried about it. I also do maintain my suction lines on a daily basis. So it's not as big of a deal, but um, this is a, an issue. So uh, backflow um, was something that the CDC talked about many years ago. Um, it's when previously suction fluids in the dental tubing flows back into the patient's mouth. And the analogy that the CDC used is when your beverage like flows back into the cup after you use a straw. So for this reason, dental staff and dental team members should advise patients not to close their lips around the tip of the ejector and bacteria and infectious particles that are lurking in those lines um, don't get suctioned back up. So gross, right? So we want to maintain our suction lines for multiple reasons, not just for equipment maintenance, um, managing aerosols that protect us, but it also helps for us to manage any black backflow concerns that would be for patient safety. Next, let's talk about our chemical indicators. This is my point, uh, my third point uh, during this course. Um, and I want to talk about chemical indicators because I have been I've just been noticing this lately that um, not everybody really understands chemical indicators um, or are using them appropriately, okay? So I just wanted to bring this up. So chemical indicators, um, you want to use an inter in in excuse me internal chemical indicator in every package. First off, we need to be wrapping it. We're not just doing loose instruments with our sterilization. I do still hear that in the world. That is a big no-no unless you're immediately using it and then there's a whole protocol for that. But most of us are not doing that, right? Like we need to use this for patients later on. And so we wanna make sure that we are wrapping them or we are bagging them in pouches. Those are also single use items. They are not to be reused. Okay. <laughs> Our indicators, um, we want usually external and internal indicators on there. 
And so for, these are some of the rules that I like to just bring up with our chemical indicators. We wanna use them um, as an internal chemical indicator in every package. And if the inter internal indicator is not visible from the outside, then we're gonna use our external indicator. Chemical indicators may be integrated into the package design, and most of us know those. The pouches, you peel them, you stick them, they have the two little squares at the bottom, tell you they have an internal and external one, and they, they're just built in. Um, we wanna inspect those indicators after sterilization and um, of the appropriate, make sure that everything has been appropriately changed as far as the color. So those chemical indicators are one, of the three ways that we monitor our sterilization practices. And we're doing, we're gonna talk about biological spore tests, but that's on a weekly basis as a minimum, according to the CDC, depending on where you are, you might be doing that daily, which is uh, amazing. But on a daily, every use you know, situation, it is our chemical indicators and our physical monitoring, making sure our unit actually reached all the time, temperature and um, pressure variables, but our chemical indicators will show us that and so we actually have six chemical indicators in dentistry i want to just highlight the ones that we are mostly using now if you have a certain type of um, autoclave or you'll use a type 2 which is known as a bowie dick but for the most part we are all using a type 1 type 4 and type 5 the type one is the one that's gonna go on the outside of your package. Um, that is when you're using your wraps, right? And you're wrapping it and you can't see that internal indicator in your cassettes, um, we have that external indicator. And that is gonna give us one variable and that's usually heat. Did it reach, you know, what, did it get hot enough in there? And at least we know that it's sterile or not sterile before we open it up. Now. One office that I was working with was like, oh, we need internal indicators. Cool, we got this. And they were taking the external indicators, kind of, you know, it's tape, so they were just doubling it and putting it on the inside. And they're like, oh, well, if it reaches the inside, that's an internal indicator. And that is a no-go, y'all. I love their uh, ingenuity, but um, that is a no-go. The one that is gonna go on the inside that is gonna be your class four or type Four indicator and that is going to give us multiple barriers uh, I'm sorry multiple variables uh, to tell us if it's either time and temperature or if it was pressure or if it was heat like it's going to give us multiple variables there so it's not just that one that sits on the top that tells us it did one thing it got hot we want to make sure that it was hot and pressurized and steam ha happened for the right amount of time and it actually reached internal components where our instruments are sitting. And then we have a type five that is considered an integrating indicator. Um, so that is gonna tell us time, temperature and pressure. I like a type five integrator in every load just to make sure it, it's not the same as a spore test, but it is much higher than our other chemical indicators. And so it's really telling us if our, our autoclave is actually doing the things that it's supposed to do to make give us sterile instruments. I also very much encourage you to put an integrator, a type five integrator into your surgical kits. If you're doing any kind of dental implants, um, I would put that to make sure these surgical items are actually reaching all the variables needed for patient care uh, of, with our sterilized instruments. So um, please let me know if you have any questions on that, um, I can clarify, but just know you need to have chemical monitoring um, and they are gonna be um, either in our pouches integrated or if we are using our cassettes where we're wrapping them, we want an internal and an external there. And just one last point here that I would like to make about our chemical indicators is that we should all be in the habit, and I say should because I am very much trying to get into the habit and sometimes I still screw it up, right? Because I am a human and we are all going to make these mistakes, but holding each other accountable in this kind of way is super important. But we want to check our chemical indicators at least three, at three checkpoints. When we remove it from the sterilizer, before they go into sterile storage, we wanna make sure, did that actually turn? You know, look at our pouches. Did that actually turn? Because how many times have we gone through sterile storage and been like, that is not clean. That is not sterile. So we wanna do it before we take it out of the autoclave and put it in sterile storage. When we go to grab it from sterile storage, we wanna, you know, just take a peek. 
Those are the colors that we want to see for sterile packaging and then before we actually open it for uh, patient care. Um, so check it those three times and then we are always making sure that our um, instruments are properly managed before we use it for patient care. And number four is our biological monitoring. So like I said, we have three different ways to manage or monitor our sterilizing practices. And that is going to be physical. So watching it, did it actually, did we get any kind of error message? chemical indicators, and then our biological monitoring. And this is a minimum of every week. This is also called your spore testing um, that people are very familiar with, um, but we wanna make sure that we are doing this at a minimum every week. It is our gold standard for sterility assurance. And there are two types of um, spore testing. So we can mail it in or we can do it in the office. I have actually uh, only ever done it in the office. And I think this is a real interesting point about legacy errors, right? <laughs> or doing things the way you've always done it. Because now that I have been roaming around the country and temping in different places and working in different practices and helping them do their infection control protocols, um, I am learning that most people are actually using mail-in. And that has very much confused me uh, because mail-in to me, um, you're gonna, you gotta go through a lot of steps to make, to, before you know that your autoclave is actually working or not, right? So I run my spore test, I put it in the mail, it gets shipped somewhere else, they run the test and then send a message back to me that it failed or passed. And if it failed, how many patients have I seen since then? I mean, I'm using instruments for, for my 8 a.m. patient probably in the afternoon. so. For me, I think it's super important to be doing biological monitoring in the office. That might not be for everybody's situation, I understand that, but I like to encourage you. I do feel like this is a best practice for patient safety. And biological spore testing um, now is super sophisticated, whereas when I was doing it, it was like a 24 hour thing, like you got, you know, tests, I, like I, the next day I came in, I'm like, oh, yep, we passed. Now we can get those results in 20 to 30 minutes. And that's huge. So if I'm doing something in the morning and my, and I run that spore test and I see that my autoclave has failed, pause, stop things. We are not using instruments on patients until we have um, ensured that it was probably human error, which is usually the case. Or is this autoclave actually not sterilizing properly? And if it's not, I'm going to quarantine a lot of my instruments since the last time that I ran a, ran a passing spore test before I use them on a patient. Because the anxiety of me calling a patient and being like, I potentially used instruments that were not sterile on you is too much for my little brain. It's just too much for my heart and my anxiety. I got too much of that already. So I like to just take this uh, worry right out of my head and I like to use the biological monitor monitoring and spore testing in the office with those super quick results. And I did wanna just show you a quick video of like what that looks like. There's an incubator, you have a control, so you keep that out, that doesn't go through the sterilizer to make sure th things are baking and cooking in their little incubator. Uh, and then we sterilize one of those, and then we make sure that our sterilize actually killed all the spores. And then we incubate it, it tells us, it gives me a readout, it's really cool, I'm a big fan. So um, again, let me know if you have questions about that. Now, one thing I will also remind you of before I move to my next topic, my last topic, is that record keeping is important, especially with our spore testing. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So we wanna make sure that we are doing good record keeping that we have, and that we also have our standard operating procedures. So if somebody that does these spore tests on a regular basis is sick, is out, I can step in and take on that task because it is so vital to patient safety that we do not want to delay. We do not want to miss. We do not want to wait for them to come back in um, before we do that. We want to stay on track and do it on a weekly basis, same day every week. Um, so record keeping, super, super important. And then moving into my final 
point here, your standard operating procedures. And I left this for the last, and I'm break, making this even a point because all of the things that I've already talked about could be sorted out if we had it written down, if we had protocols for everybody to follow. And so your standard operating procedures, I like to call them, like they are your guidebook, right? They are the thing that we all need to be following. And I think standard operating procedures or SOPs as I will call it, are very, very important um, to our dental practice, but I have not been in a practice that has actually had. I haven't had an SOP given to me since I was in school, and that was 19 years ago, right? So I haven't worked for big DSOs, and so they might have some of those things already in place, but a lot of the small practices that I've been in do not have these standard operating procedures and guides on how to be safe in their practice. And I always tell people, just because I have a dental education and a two thumbs does not make me an expert in infection prevention. I know how to go through the practices, I know how to do the things, but I don't know how to do these things in your practice specifically. So you need to tell me how I'm gonna keep you, your team, and your patients safe if I'm walking into your practice for the first time. So. Um, it makes sure that we ensure consistent patient care, it promotes a safety culture, and it helps make sure that we redo our, we are meeting the requirements uh, for compliance and regulations. It's also your source of truth. This is your source of truth. So, Cause we are all human beings with human brains. We have little things that start happening um, occasionally where like I might digress from a little task a little bit, or I might start doing something with gloved hands and there's somebody else is doing it with un ungloved hands. And then eventually, sometimes that creates contention. We get a little bickering, like, I don't know why she does it like this. I don't know why he's doing it like this. They've been doing it like that. And it doesn't make any sense to me. We can knock out all of that nonsense if we have a source of truth. This is how we do this thing in our practice. And it can be, it's, you know, it's a living document. We can change it, you can alternate, you can change your products, um, you can update it as needed. I encourage you to do that. But as in, the, in this moment in time in dentistry, we have way too many people coming in and out. We are pulling people off the streets, warm bodies to help us because we are so short staffed. And it, this is the time that we need these standard operating procedures to make sure that everybody's on the same page for the maintenance of your equipment, your very expensive equipment, to make sure that it is working the way that it should, that we are not voiding warranties, but that we are staying safe as a team and that our patients are always having a safe dental visit with us. Um, I also think it helps build a safety culture. And this is gonna just kind of be my like final point here. Safety cultures, um, they do not happen by accident. That was a quote from a speaker that is, I'm forgetting his name now, um, that I saw at the OSAP 2022 conference. Um, he said, you know, uh, safety culture does not happen by accident. It is something that you have to manage and create. And if we are not having a safety culture in our practice, a lot of these things will not happen. But at SOP, our standard operating procedures, helps start us with a safety culture. you making sure that we are all talking about how do we do this procedure? How can we come together to make sure we're all consistent and we have continuity Continuity, and that if anybody were to walk into our office and start helping us and working with us, that we have, um, they know how to do it as well. Um, just as a quick reminder though, um, with your SOPs, like I said before, it is a living document. You wanna schedule your reviews of your SOPs. We wanna go, are, is our water line maintenance working for us? Are we failing? Are we failing consistently our testing? because that's a problem let's talk about our shock is the shock working for everyone or is it annoying tell me your pros and cons out of it your dental suctions um are we using the bucket are we doing the things that we should do is everybody checking with their chemical indicators three times if not let's talk about it you know like we're gonna uh, alter this and um, make it unique to our practice it is a living document and just as a final point as I kind of wrap up and we kind of take Q&A, some questions uh, right now. I just want you to know the journey to expertise has been long and with many mistakes. Like I said, I started 23 years ago on the job. I have done it all 
<laughs> um, not all of it, but a lot of it. You know, I was a reuser of a mask. I didn't wear the right mask. I didn't know my a like level mask that I was using. Um, I d just didn't. I was taught certain things by the assistants um, when I was on the job trained. Like I saw an assistant always put her hand in the cold sterile, cold sterile, and the ultrasonic, and like it didn't dawn on me to be like, hold up, <laughs> hold up. That's kind of gross. That's not okay. Um, so my road to, uh, well, along this journey has not always been easy. I am a clinician. I am a human. I've gotten it all wrong. But if we are not establishing a safety culture and if we are not stab establishing those standard operating procedures, we will find a lot of these mistakes happening in our practices. And again, I mentioned at the top of this, uh, you know, presentation is that infection control is often seen as annoying. It's a nuisance. It's a thing that costs us money. It's a thing that we have to do. And it's not always seen as the foundation of patient care. And so I do want you to know that it can become consciously, you know, uh, competent. So unconsciously competent, I should say, where you're doing this without even thinking, right? We do hand hygiene, we're checking our chemical indicators, but it does take practice and it does take an effort to get to that place. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you uh, for allowing me to spend this time with you. Um, I do know that this is an overwhelming topic a lot of times, but I hope you feel encouraged to go back and kind of check in with your team members, establish some SOPs. And if you are just feeling way too overwhelmed by all of it, um, you can check in with me. Uh, you can follow me um, on social or head over to my website. I'd be happy to work with you and your team to create an ICC. I have a lot of digital courses on this where I train your ICC specifically uh, virtually. And then I am also doing one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, virtually to help you to create those standard operating procedures because I know they are a lot. Um, and again, I do wanna thank Elevate for allowing me to come on here and chat with you all. And please, let's jump into your questions. Um, I'm sure you have a few of them. All right, Michelle, thank you so much for such a great uh, webinar with so much information. And I think everyone appreciates your honesty too with the mistakes that have been made that we've all made. Um, I know when you asked to send in smiley faces for the legacy errors, we saw quite a few come in. So I think that a lot of people can relate to making a lot of these, these mistakes. So you made this a comfortable space for us to ask some great questions, which some came through here. Awesome. All right, so I'm gonna start with the first one, which I think is very important. It says, how would you suggest that I approach my dentist on the need for the infection control coordinator? Um, so I would say, I would ask you, I guess, is your doctor financially driven or emotionally driven? Because if it's on the financial side, I would um, discuss, you know, equipment maintenance and, you know, because like I said, hand, it goes hand in hand, infection control and equipment maintenance. Oftentimes, um, they're kind of one and the same. So let's, you know, if we're talking suction line maintenance, like that's not cheap. You know, we want to make sure that we don't have a dental office down day and we're having it's not calling rotor rooter to get those like pipes cleaned out, guys. Like this is like digging into baseboards and pulling up floors to figure out where the clog is on our suction. So, like, I would ask you, are they emotionally driven? Are we kind of pulling at heartstrings or are we uh, financially driven? And we can talk about how we would be saving the office um, some serious downtime and the cost of new equipment. Okay, great. Thanks. And then an another question came in is how would the ICC differ from like your office uh, OSHA officer? Uh, that's actually a very good question. And thank you for asking that because they are often one and the same. Um, I think an ICC is uh, that person that's going to apply all of the CDC guidance and the OSHA standards clinically day to day. Because when you think about OSHA, like we're filling out our binders, we're making sure we have exit plans, emergency exit plans. We got our hazard communication symbols and stuff everywhere. But this is like your day in, day out stuff. Are we, you know, are we all good with our disinfecting wipes? 
How do we feel about that? Is it ruining any equipment? Um, are we doing hand hygiene? Are we doning and doffing our PPE um, the right way? So I feel like the OSHA person, um, like we're doing that on a regular basis, but this ICC is day in, day out stuff. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying. And then someone said, what should we do when shocking doesn't sufficiently clean the water line? The test continues to fail. Oh, so I would definitely encourage you to reach out to whoever you're working with as far as like the testing, if you're using the paddle test, a lot of times those, um, like I can, I'll say like Pro Edge, I know for a fact they have like a water line or water lab. So you send in samples to them, but they have amazing customer service. And I'm sure a lot of them all have amazing customer service because there are things out there. There's like a lot of little details about your unit that you might not even realize, like something called a dead leg. I mean, I never heard of a dead leg. I thought they were talking about a pirate or something. And I was like, what is a dead leg? And it's where um, something is collecting that biofilm maybe it had water go through it at one point and you're not using it any longer or maybe it's a, a pipe or a i'm sorry like a, a tubing that's like coiled up in the unit somewhere that that is actually the little reservoir that's just feeding the bacteria so every time you shock shock the shock itself is not going through that pipe so it just feeds back into your tubing so I would definitely contact your um, customer service person uh, or a team of the testing company that you're using. Okay, great, thanks. And then this one came up a, a couple times. So if you could just clarify, how frequently should water lines be tested and shocked? So it's definitely gonna depend on like, so for instance, with this last uh, question, you know, if they're failing it, um, we're testing and shocking more frequently. Um, like if once we got to a place where we were passing, that shock or i'm sorry that test i would probably only shock once a month and then once we have consistent uh passing of those tests i would move us to maybe a three month it also depends on your daily maintenance uh, so in my airflow machine i currently cannot use any daily maintenance so i am using a low grade like shock on a nightly basis um, i would love not to do that all the time i'd love to move it to three months but i just can't use that low grade daily chemical if you're doing something and it's been consistently working you've never really failed um, a test i would think three months every three months is a good shock um, protocol but it really is going to be i would look at your instructions for use for your shock and for the test and for your daily chemical um, and then kind of get guidance from all of those instructions for use Perfect, thank you. And then I thought this was a great question too. This person said they were always taught not to allow patients to use suction after fluoride varnish is applied because it could clog lines. Is that still true? It, I do believe that is still true. Um, now, if you were using something like Floramax, like I use, there's not a lot of extra stuff um, after uh, the patient, after I apply it. But yeah, I would be very cautious about like, clumps of your uh, fluoride going into that suction line because yeah, it can create, um, make it very sluggish and create uh, some clogs. Okay. And then um, when you were talking about the different types of the chemical indicators, someone said to check with you, is a type five chemical indicator mandatory in each load or recommended? It's not mandatory. Um, it's definitely recommended. Um, and I, I, I would even say it's recommended by me. <laughs> I think that would be your best practices. And so if we're thinking about our chemical indicators and the things that we are sh we should be doing based off of CDC guidance and you know evidence-based uh, guidance, it is that's kind of like minimum standard of care, right? Like your um, internal indicators and your external indicators. I think like if we're going to elevate um, our best practice to best practices, it would be an integrator in every load. And I think I, now this is just, again, my opinion on this. I think it is a bare minimum if you're doing surgical stuff, like you have an implant kit or your surgical um, uh, kits that you use, I would put an integrator in that because I, if I'm going to go do surgery, I want to make sure that all of those variables were hit for sterilization. Okay, great. Thanks. Another question was about flushing water lines through hand pieces at the beginning of the day, and they were wondering if that actually does 
do any good. So what the, the, re, the guidance for that is to flush the lines 30 seconds. Um, I actually, I think it's like two minutes in the morning, like right when you get in there and then between patients. And the reason for that is that stagnation that I talked about where it, we let it sit all night long. So everything that kind of, you know, was baking in our lines all night long, we're trying to push as much as we can through that. And also get the chemical that we might have used in that water bottle. Like if you just filled it and you're not doing the tubes, maybe you're doing the tablets, you kind of want to flush that through and get that going through the lines as well. Okay, great. Um, someone asked for you to elaborate just a little bit on the spore testing. Are the spore tests placed into sterilization bags or in the sterilization sterilizer unbagged? That's a, a great question and one I just had a conversation about it. Um, I tell people you want to challenge your spore test the same way you're challenging your instruments. And by that, I mean, if you are running your instruments um, in cassettes, or, or I'm sorry, wrapped or in pouches, then you want to do the same to your uh, spore test. So that we make, and if you're running it on the wrap cycle, you want to make sure that it's going in a pouch in, for that, in that case. Okay, perfect. And we'll wrap it up here with the last question. And um, this person wanted to know, what do you recommend as far as they document? Their office currently documents as far as sterilization, the cycle number, the time, the date on each pouch, and um, using integrators with each cycle. Is that still recommended? Yes. Um, so on your uh, pouches and on your wraps, you want to put the the person who is doing it, do so initials are fine, the date, the load number, and then what sterilizer. And that's mostly if you have like, you know, two, if you have a statum and an autoclave or two autoclaves, you want to make sure that you know where those pouches came from. So if somebody were to open it and be like, oh my gosh, these didn't pass, um, or the chemical indicators didn't turn, you can go back and look at that particular autoclave or, or statum or whatever you're using. So there's four um, pieces of information and just to throw them out again, it is the person. And I this is important to put the initial because like if I consistently see um, something not being wrapped, you know, properly, the pouches are being folded double, like they, you know, not on the perforated line. If I'm not seeing indicators inside of cassettes, you know, I want to go have a conversation with that person and, you know, like see what's going on so I can correct that. So that's a, one reason we put the initials on there. And then you're going to put the date, the load number of that day, and then um, the sterilizer that you are um, putting it in. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation this evening, Michelle. And I am sure that Level Up Infection Prevention will probably be getting a lot of phone calls after this because I think you really helped to clarify some things and really simplify it for people. So really, thank you so much for the presentation. And thank you to all of our attendees for spending your Tuesday evening with us. And just a reminder to our guests, your CE certificate will be emailed automatically within an hour or two after this presentation. So be sure to check your spam folder. And then also follow us on Facebook and Instagram for links to our future free CE events. The link that you can see on the screen will give you access to our archived webinars, including this e evening's webinar, which should be accessible in just a few short weeks. And feel free to share this link with your staff and colleagues. And finally, on our Elevate Oral Care website, you will find buttons to request an informative CE eligible staff meeting for your office. Education on the latest evidence in oral health prevention is what we do, and we would be honored to meet with you and your team to help you best serve your patients. So thank you and have a wonderful rest of the week, and we hope to see you on our next Elevating Care webinar.